The Bible says, bless the Lord, or glorify the Lord, or praise the Lord, or exalt the name of the Lord. It says, oh my soul, bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits. And he goes on to explain, the psalmist does, all these wonderful benefits we have. He says he forgives our iniquities. He heals our diseases. He redeems our life from destruction. He crowns us with loving kindness and tender mercies, and he satisfies our mouth with good things. So as we think about all these things that God has done for us, it's all we can do, but to stop, we can't stop ourselves from rejoicing and taking joy in the Lord and what he's done for us. Because we think about who he is and what he's done for us, that can only be our response. And so Philippians 4, 4 says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. So if you would, please stand with us as we rejoice, as we praise this wonderful God that we serve. same God that never fails will not fail me now, will not fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. You're working all things out. Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Praise to glorify God. 
Let's pray together, shall we? Jesus, we thank you this morning as we have heard this song and all the songs that we've sung this morning, Lord, it has been <clears throat> a, truly a, a warmth to our heart. Jesus, thank you for shedding your blood for our sins. Thank you for doing what we could not do. Thank you for being willing and Lord, we, we just ask this morning that our hearts would be turned toward you in a way like never before. And that uh, through your word this morning and by your spirit, you will speak to our hearts and cause us to have a renewed love and, and gratitude in our hearts for you, Jesus, in this new year. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Wow, what great music this morning and what a way to... Uh, to lead right into the message there with uh, that incredible song. Thank you, Abby and the team for, for singing, Gary for playing. <clears throat> it really just puts everything into perspective, doesn't it? It puts everything into perspective of why we're here, 
why we are saved, how we're saved, what God is doing in our hearts, and, and what we have for eternity. What, what an incredible, incredible blessing we have in Jesus. Well, I want to say before we get into our message, thank you for the gifts and cards and the, the expressions of love at Christmas time. Everybody was so generous and kind, and just the, the words and the cards and the way that you um, uh, expressed your love for us at this time was, is a blessing as always. And uh, I, I made a comment last week about ornaments and how um, certain ornaments go on the, the real tree and other ornaments go on the, you know, the kind of secondary tree. And then I got like three ornaments after the service. So I was like, oh, man, you talk about putting your foot in your mouth, you know. But I will say this. Hey, the ornaments we got, man, they go on the good tree. So good job, everybody. All right. Um, I, was, I was pleasantly surprised. You know, it's one of those things where you're like, oh, no, this is an ornament. It made the cut. So it's great. So uh, I appreciate that. But probably... One of the most confusing gifts I got was this one, and, and I know you can't really see it, but it's a thing with candy in it, and it's a monkey with symbols, and <clears throat> somebody got this for me and said, when I saw this, I thought of you, <laughs> and I don't know if that's because I like candy or if there's a resemblance. I don't know, but nonetheless, that's a blessing. I got that this morning, so better late than never, and... Quite an expression of love at Christmas time. All right, we're going to get into our sermon this morning and, and our series for the month of January. So, obviously, it's going to be called Foundational. And it's the five foundational principles concerning salvation. Now, a lot of times when you start talking about salvation to people who are already believers, which I would assume that most of us gathered this morning are already believers in Jesus. Uh, we've already been born again. <clears throat> We're saved. So a lot of times when you think about hearing about salvation, you're like, hey, I got that. You know, I've got that taken care of. I got saved. You can go back to the day and the time, and you know in your heart that Jesus saved you, and you kind of say, hey, that good. I'm, I'm good to go. And that, that is true. We are. Praise the Lord that we're saved, right? Um, and so that is one thing that we can rest in, right? We can rest in the fact that I am saved. But one of the key truths about salvation is salvation, <clears throat> as God terms it through the entirety of the Bible, is actually an ongoing process. Now, don't get me wrong. When you put your faith in Jesus, you are saved. And you are held forever, and there is nothing that can change that. So it's not that you can get saved and then you're getting more saved, so to speak, you are in right standing with God because of Jesus. All the things we sang this morning, right? You are in right standing with God because of Jesus. So you are saved. But an element of salvation is that it is a progress. It's a progressive thing as well. Sometimes we call it sanctification, which just means becoming more and more like Jesus as we grow in our faith. So that's kind of... Um, what we're going to think about in these next five weeks, okay, is, is salvation, <clears throat> the five foundational principles of salvation, and why they matter both to the lost and to the saved. Because I got to tell you, the gospel, we need the gospel every day of our lives. If you get saved when you're five and you die at 105, you still need the gospel every day. Because the gospel reminds us that we deserve nothing and that Jesus did everything and what we're going to see these five weeks is that it's by scripture alone that we know about salvation it's by faith alone that we have salvation it's by the grace of God alone that we've been extended salvation it is by um, trying to think of my four, fourth and fifth I have it. So we have um, scriptures, grace, faith, grace. It's by Jesus Christ alone. It only comes through Jesus. He's the only way, right? So we have those four. And then finally, in fifth, is to the glory of God. And that is 
the extension of salvation. That is the growth, the sanctification part. The only way we can glory in salvation is in God alone. We can't say that we earned any of it, right? And so these five things, these five foundational principles of salvation is what we're going to look at over the next five Sundays. Now, many of our Sunday morning series are like a storyline. They're linear, okay? So like, for example, if we go through a book of the Bible, we go verse by verse, linear through kind of what the idea of that whole book is. Some of our series are like that. This series is more like building blocks, okay? It's not linear. It's putting together a whole. It's putting together a whole complete story, kind of like a puzzle, right? Uh, you, if, you're, if you do puzzles the right way, you start with the outside, right? Who's with me on that, right? If you do puzzles, right? Okay, good. We have normal people in here this morning. So if you do puzzles, you always start with the outside, get that done, and then you can fill in the middle. Uh, but it's like a puzzle, right? You, you put those pieces together, and they make the whole. And so that's what we're going to look at. at in the next five weeks are building, putting the pieces in place to show us a full picture of salvation according to God, okay? So today we're going to start with Scripture. When you hear the word authority... What feelings or thoughts come into your mind and your heart? Authority. A lot of times it's a negative context, isn't it? You think about authorities or someone who tries to have authority over you. If you're a young person, you think about your teachers or your parents and how they are authorities in your life. And many times you feel like they're out to get you, right? Or they're out to ruin your fun. And so authorities have sometimes a negative context. You think about government authority and... Um, it, right, wrong, or indifferent, the government has done things to cause us to have some negative tendencies or negative feelings and thoughts about authority. Um, you know, they've done things like that. But the, when we think of authority, when it comes to truth, there is one, right? There's one authority when it comes to truth. And that authority is the Word of God. The final authority in all matters of faith and practice in the church, and hear this, and specifically when it comes to what we believe and act upon, is the Bible. It is the Bible. The Bible alone. Um, when I, I'm going to use that word alone a lot over the next five weeks. This is loosely built on um, the, the Reformation period. Now, I understand Baptists were never... You know, in the Catholic Church, we never came out of the Catholic Church. I understand that. I'm not saying that we are Protestants. We are not. I get that. But what Martin Luther said during those years of Reformation is he said, basically, there are five foundational truths about salvation, and it doesn't matter what anybody thinks, it's scripturally based. And the very first thing that he said was sola only or alone, scripture. Scripture alone. Because there are many religions in the world that will put traditions of church fathers or traditions of church leaders alongside of Scripture and treat them the same. And what Luther said and what we believe, not because Luther said it, but because it's true, what he said was, no, 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 no. Throw everything else out the window and it's Scripture alone. It's only what the Bible says we place our faith on, right? We base our beliefs on, and especially when it comes to salvation, especially when it comes to salvation, but all manners of faith and practice. So the Bible alone is the final authority in all manners of faith and practice. Now, here's the question for us this morning, church. In the face of cultural pressure, and it's coming to America, it's coming. In the face of cultural pressure, and even churches who are weakening the truth to be palatable to the culture, the question is, church, are we going to hold to the Scripture alone as the final authority of what we believe? That's the question we have to wrestle with. Because it's not going to get easier as the years go on, right? As, as, as culture gets progressively worse and worse, this is not going to get easier. 
to stick with what the Bible says and to say, I'm a firm believer in the word of God and if the word of God can contradicts what our culture or our government or our friends or our influencers say, I go with the Bible. And to stand on the truth of the Bible is going to take some guts. It really is. So we have to determine, are we willing to do it? Are we going to be Bible believers and practicers practitioners, or are we going to say we believe the Bible and do something else? That's what it comes down to. You know, when churches die is when they go away from this book. Where there is no vision, the people perish. That's not talking about a vision that a pastor has. That's talking about revelation. Where there is no vision, the people perish. If we're not going to stick to the Bible, let's pack up and go home because we're no longer a church, right? Right? So we need to be determined. So today we're going to see clear statements in the Bible, about the Bible, and its power as the final authority. So let's turn, if you would, to first, or 2 Peter, uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, please. 2 Peter chapter 1. We're going to read two verses, and then we're going to pray. We have other places we're going to turn today, so keep your Bible handy. But I mean, come on. I was having a conversation with a fellow the other day, and... Um, He's a brother in Christ, and he was asking me, he said, you know, I, I have some, some neighbors who are new believers. And he said, you know, how do you, how do you encourage them to believe the Bible and the Word of God and not go with the current of culture without pouring water on their fire? You know, how do you, how do you tell them, hey, there's false prophets out there. There are, there are false teachers out there that are teaching a a, a a false gospel, a prosperity gospel, right? That God just wants everything to go great for you. And if you believe in God, you'll never have a problem. And you can do all these things because you're awesome and because God wants you to be awesome. And he says, how do you manage uh, teaching a new believer that, uh, you know, it's really what the Bible says, not what some false teacher says, without pouring water on their fire as a believer, without turning them away from the church? And I said, that's a great question. And my answer was, you got to point them to the scriptures. Point them to the scriptures. Because if you hear a person get up and they claim to be from God and they're not teaching this, they're not reading from the Bible, they're not giving you the scriptures, they're not uh, expositing the, the passages, they're not walking through them and teaching what the, the Lord says, walk away. Walk away. Because that's not church. Now, it could be a, a fun place to go and feel good, but it's not church, right? So we have to stick to the Bible. And it wouldn't it be strange for me to say it's by Scripture alone today and not go to the Word, right? Come on. So we're going to go to the Word. Second Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. Knowing this first. Uh-oh, there's first priority right off the bat. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation, period. Next verse. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Now this is the word of the Lord. And we're thankful for it this morning. And so let's pray and ask him, to take his word, plant it deep within us, it can shape and fashion us into his likeness, right? And we can not just believe what it says, but carry out what it says. Now let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for your word. Thank you for speaking it. Thank you that it's not a dead word. It's not old. It's ever living. Every time we read it, you speak again. It comes out of your mouth again. Because it's alive, and your Holy Spirit is still speaking it fresh and new every time it's read or proclaimed. What a miracle. What a powerful word. And so, Lord, the only response to that is to yield to it, to love it, to hold it as not just the final authority for a church, but also for our personal life. So, Lord, convince our hearts this morning of your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. 
So we see here, we're, gonna, we're just going to launch from these two verses here. The truth about the Bible is, the Bible says a lot about itself. And what it says here is that there is no prophecy, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation, meaning this. If God has said it, he's not only revealed it to a handful of people. There's not just a few people who know it and understand it and everybody else can't know it, okay? Uh, Sometimes people can help us understand it a little bit better, right? There are people who study the Bible, they teach the Bible. We thank God for them, for the Bible preachers and teachers in our lives because they help it come alive to us. They help us see new dimensions and and bring out new, not new truth, but new aspects of the truth as it's surrounded in context. So we thank God for that. But listen, this word that God spoke is for all who will hear it, for anyone who will hear it. It's not of any private interpretation. So this is for all who will hear it. And, verse 21 says, the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. Aren't you thankful for that? What does that mean? That means it wasn't a bunch of guys got together and said, now, we need to write a book about God. Okay? That's what that means. Because, hey, if we all got together and wrote a book about God, there would be tons of errors in it wouldn't there? Because we can't know everything about God. We can't know his heart. We can't know his mind. We can't know what he's doing. So what God did, get this, what God did is he spoke to people what his mind and what his heart and what he's doing so that we could know it. Not that we made it up, but he gave it to us so that we could understand. Boy, am I glad for that. Aren't you glad that God gave it to us? He spoke it to us. So it wasn't by the will of man, thank God. How did it come? People ask this question all the time. How do we get the Bible? Here's the answer. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So holy men of God, men who devoted themselves to Jesus, men who in the Old Testament who devoted themselves to God and hearing, his, hearing him speak, as God spoke to them, they recorded it. As he moved in their heart, they recorded it. It came direct revelation from God to man. He spoke it. It came by the Holy Ghost. And if you hadn't picked up on it yet, we are Trinitarian. I know that sounds scary, right? Like, well, no, we're Baptists. Yeah, we're Baptists. But Trinitarian means we believe that God is three in one, right? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. So the Father is God. Jesus is God. The Holy Spirit is God. They're all equally God. There's no God junior. There's no one that's more powerful. They're all God. So if the Holy Ghost spoke it, if he moved in the heart of these men, who gave it to him? God. We have God himself gave the word to mankind. It's not called the word of man, it's called the word of God for a reason. And God gave it on his authority. Right? It's on his authority. Here's what we need to understand. When you're a Bible teacher or preacher, if you're preaching the truth, you are going to say some things that are, number one, going to go against your own heart. (laughs) Let's be real. And you're also going to say some things that are going to go against the heart of your leaders, or your, your hearers. And it's not because the preacher, or it shouldn't be because, the preacher or teacher is trying to get people. That's not the motive. It's that we're just telling what's in here. We're just proclaiming what's already been given. That's, that's our job as Bible preachers and teachers. And honestly, we're all proclaimers. We really are. Our whole purpose is not to tell them what we think. It's to tell them what God said. And so sometimes people are going to hear things and they're going to say, well, I don't like what that preacher said. Well, if the preacher's talking about himself or his opinions, you can choose not to like it. And that's okay. But if he is preaching or she, if it's a teacher, is preaching the word of God and you say, well, I don't like what they said. Well, it's no longer them that you don't like. It's you don't like what God has said. Let's get that right. Because some people will say, well, you know, that church said this, so I don't like that church. Well, if that church said it from here, you, it's not that you have a beef with the church. You have a beef with God. And it's his authority. Not mine, not Baptists, right? Not our Constitution. It's on the authority of the word of God. 
So he spoke it from his mouth. That's good authority. All right. So let's go to 2 Timothy 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. And we're going to start in verse 15. And we're actually going to go into the next chapter. So 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. And we're going to go into chapter 4, verse 4. Okay, so keep following along. 2 Timothy 3, 15. Now remember, Timothy doesn't mean Timothy wrote this. It's Paul wrote it to Timothy, his protege. He says this to Timothy. Uh, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. So Paul says to Timothy, he says, I want, to, I want you to get something right. Because he's, he's teaching him as a protege, he's going to be pastoring and preaching. So he's passing on these things to him. He says, here's something I want you to get right, first of all. You have known, verse 15, you have known from the time that you were a child, you have known the Holy Scriptures. We find out in, in other parts of this, these letters that uh, Timothy's mother and grandmother taught him the Scripture. Okay? So he's referring to that. He says, you've known this since you were a child. And what does the Holy Scripture do? What did Paul say in verse 15 that the Holy Scripture does for us? It makes us wise unto salvation. Right? That's what it does for us. So if you want to know about salvation, where do you turn? Holy Scriptures, right? That's where we turn. We don't turn to a church, a constitution, a pope, a priest, a pastor. Their opinions do not matter. We turn to the Holy Scripture. And the Holy Scripture is able to make us wise unto salvation. It's able to show us how to be saved. And it says here, through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Now, that's next week. All right, next week is the faith part. But it's, it's, it's building the picture. Paul says, it's through the Holy Scriptures we know about salvation. And then he comes to verse 16. And then he tells us this famous verse. That all Scripture, do you notice the word all there? Right? And everybody's waiting for the preacher to say, I studied the word all in Greek. And the word all in Greek means all, right? Uh, funny. All right. We got the word all means all, right? All scripture, all of it. How was it given? By inspiration. You tell me, what does inspiration mean? God breathed it out. God actually spoke it. Isn't that awesome? It didn't come by, by osmosis, right? They weren't just sitting there and their hands started to move and they wrote words. No, God actually breathed it. And you want to talk about a miracle, brothers and sisters? Every time you open the Bible and you begin to read the words, do you realize that God is breathing it out again to your heart? Wow! That's why it says the Bible is alive. It's quick. It's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. Because it's still being breathed every time it's given or read. Wow! It's the words of life. This is, this is what we have. This is why we should have a great deal of respect for the Bible. Because it's the words of life. The Bible is not Jesus. The Bible did not die on the cross for our sins. We don't worship the Bible. We worship Jesus. But how do we know everything we know about God? Because he breathed it out to us. What a treasure, right? It's a treasure of ours. 
So we have this treasure. The scripture was given by the breath of God. And he says it's good for four things, right? Look at verse 16. It's good for four things. For doctrine, teaching what is right. It's good for reproof, teaching how we can realize what is wrong in our life. We call that conviction. We may read or hear something from the Bible, and the Holy Spirit says, hmm, you might want to deal with that. Okay, the Bible does that to us. It's good for correction. It corrects us when we're wrong. It doesn't just say you might want to do something about that. It says here's how to fix it. And it's good for instruction and in righteousness. It teaches us how to do what is right. Not just to not do what's wrong, but to do what is right. What a treasure. And it's all breathed out by God. That means it came on good authority, right? The Bible came on good authority. And we have everything we need in the Bible from God's own mouth. Miracle. Verse 17, he says, the word of God instructs the man of God. And then you can say this. Now, this, he, he is talking to a preacher. He is talking to a potential pastor and church leader. But what we need to understand is the Bible also instructs every man and woman of God. I don't mean that you know, women should be pastors. Okay, so chill out. What I mean is, if you are a woman who is a born-again believer, and you're reading the Word of God, it should make you a woman of God. Yeah. So that's what I mean by that. So, a man or woman of God, it instructs us to become one of God's people. Okay? How to be living in the way that he spoke. That's right. Makes sense, doesn't it? It's good. So then we can go to uh, chapter 4. And now he gives a charge. Now, again, he gives a charge to a guy who's going to be preaching and pastoring. Right? He says, preach the word. It's a charge to a guy who's going to be pastoring and preaching. But we're all supposed to proclaim the word. Preach just means proclaim. Okay? So, in a sense, when a young lady or a woman stands on the platform and proclaims a song with the word of God, you know what they're doing? They're preaching by definition. Okay? They're proclaiming the word of God. When you sit across the table from a friend who's hurt or needs, needs an encouraging word and you give them the word of God, you are preaching to them. You're proclaiming the word of God to them. So there's that wide context. And then there's the specific context to this guy. But look what he says. He starts in, cha in chapter 4 by saying, I charge thee. So here's a charge. I am, I am putting this in your keeping. I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, God and Jesus are witnessing what I'm putting in your keeping. Who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. What was he saying? The final authority who spoke his word. He's going to judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and in his kingdom. He's the king. What about him? Preach the word. What he said, you say. Just tell people what he said. That's the job. Preach the word. And that's why we say if you, if you hear a guy or, or somebody who's not preaching the Bible, they may be saying nice and good things, but they're not preaching the word. Okay? So just be aware. But preach the word. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. In other words, be able to do it all times. Whether people think it's appropriate or not, preach it. Proclaim it. Whether people don't realize they need it or not, give it. Give them the word, right? Because not everybody thinks they need it. But we have to give it. We go through times when we think, well, you know, I may, I may not need that right now. We all need it all the time, if we're honest. Okay, so preach it. Preach the word, whether or not we know we need it or not. Preach it. And be patient, though, and teach with all long suffering and doctrine. So he says, in your preaching, in your proclaiming, be patient and teach. We're not just out there to, you know, clear off a spot and, and let her rip, right? There's a place for that. But in our preaching, and our proclaiming, we're to be patient and teach. There's a, a hint of discipleship in there that comes along with it. 
He tells us, though, he warns us that there's going to come a time, verse 3, when not everybody's going to want to hear sound doctrine or proper truth, the truth of God. There's going to come a time not everybody's going to want to hear that. And so what they'll do is they'll gather teachers that will make them feel better about themselves. Okay? They'll find people who will say things that will just make them feel good. So he says, beware, understand that's going to happen. But you just keep preaching the truth no matter what. Verse 4 says, they'll turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Notice the dichotomy there between the word of God and the opinion of man. You have the truth and fables. It's two different things, isn't it? And so we have the truth, we proclaim the truth, our own opinions. They might be good for some things, but you cannot compare them to the truth, right? So the truth is king. The truth is the final authority. The Bible is the final authority. So we're going to finish with Jesus' examples. How did Jesus feel about the Bible? Well, we know he quoted it all the time. Trivia question, which book of the Old Testament did Jesus quote the most? Man, come on. Give him a chance, dude. He's that guy, right? He's that guy in school. Ooh, you know. I know you know it, Gary. Let's let somebody else have a chance. You know. That's good, man. I have some of those in my Bible class, too. Oh, Mr. Keller, Mr. Keller, I know you know it. Let's let some of the other people, you know. Anyway, Deuteronomy. Very good, Gary. All right. Get your star later. All right. Now, Deuteronomy. So Jesus quoted in the Bible all the time when he would preach and teach. But there's two powerful examples that Jesus had that we can pull out of, of all the times he used the Bible. The first one for me is Matthew chapter 4. And it's Jesus' temptations. When, the, when Satan is tempting Jesus, right? I mean, if there was ever a time for Jesus just to, boom, assert his authority and be like, I'm God, you're not, back off. It was then. And all of us would have been like, yeah, right? But what did Jesus do? He said three times in verses 4, 7, and 10, it is written. How did Jesus feel about Scripture? He used it. He, he put it into practice in practical ways in his own life and temptation. Now, friends, if Jesus does that, this better carry some weight for me and you, right? If Jesus is going to use this in that way, and he, he sees it in that way, then you and I dead better sure see it in that way. He encouraged he not only fought off temptation with the scripture, but he encouraged his believers with the scriptures. I go to Luke chapter 24, one of my favorite passages in all the Bible. Such, a, such an awesome moment. If you're a sentimental person, Luke 24 will, will get your heart. It's like the hallmark movie of Bible chapters, okay? It is, it is awesome, okay? You remember the account? There's a couple of disciples. Jesus has uh, died. He has risen. Uh, it's the day that he rose, and there's rumors swirling that Jesus rose, but not everybody has seen him yet, right? So there are some of his disciples who are walking to a place called Emmaus, and they're walking, and they're bummed. They've, they've heard the rumors a little bit, but they've not seen him, so they are bummed. It's been three days, and Jesus is dead, and they, they put everything on him, and man, they are in the depths of despair. And Jesus comes along to him. He kind of disguises himself in some way, and they don't realize it's him. He's like, hey, what's going on, guys? What's the talk of the town? Like, where are you from, bro? Haven't you heard? Where, where have you been? You know, this, this Jesus, we, we thought he was the Messiah, and we, we did everything. We left everything and followed him, and, and he's dead. It's been three days since he died, and there's rumors floating around that he rose again, but man, he's He's gone. Where, have you, where are you from? How do you not know this? And Luke 24, 27 says, And beginning at Moses, meaning the first five books of the Bible, and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. He didn't pull his hood back and go, It's me! Could have done that. 
He didn't say, hey, guys, listen up. I know you're a bum, but let me tell you. I'm alive. Let's go get something to eat. Everything's good. No. He pointed them to what God has always said about him. It's powerful. That's why it affected their hearts. What did they say later on? Didn't our hearts burn within us? Was it when he revealed himself? No. Didn't our hearts burn within us as he gave us the scriptures? You ever had that heartburn? The good kind? Because the word of God so gripped you that your heart just burned. Well, how does that happen? Because it is still coming out of the mouth of God. Phenomenal. Incredible. What a gift. It is from the mouth of God, embraced by the God-man, and it's our final authority. So in the face of cultural pressure, and the churches who are trying to to sway a little bit or maybe just cut back on it a little bit because of uh, maybe trying to be relevant or trying to be palatable to, to culture, Christian, brother, sister, what are you gonna do? First of all, it's a personal matter. Does the Bible have true final authority in my life? Meaning, not just do I know it, but do I believe it? Because if I believe it, I will act on it. And then as a church, how will we honor and hold to the scripture? Will it be our final authority? Well, I know that we've come to this place and among this people because We do view the Bible as God's final authority. And until he comes, right, may we always hold it there. Let's stand together, please. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. This is a moment of of reflection. Now, how is this this personal? How 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 do I take what God has said through his spirit and by his word today, and how do I... Let that affect me now in, well, 2023. So let's just bow before Jesus right now. And if you are not saved, if you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, the Bible is the truth about salvation. And the Bible says that Jesus Christ died on the cross as a perfect God-man, died on the cross for our sins, He took God's penalty for sin upon himself. He was buried, and three days later, he did rise again from the dead. In so doing, he conquered death, hell, and the grave. He defeated sin. And so by doing this, the Bible says, if we place our faith in Jesus Christ alone, our souls will be saved and heaven will be our home. So if you're here and you're not saved, If you believe Jesus Christ is who he says he is, and you believe that he did what he said he did, then place your faith in him in this moment. If you're already saved, you already know Jesus as your Savior, how do you hold the Bible as authority in your life? Our obedience to the Bible gives us an x-ray of what we truly believe. If there are parts that we ignore, then there are parts that we truly don't hold to. So let's ask God to make his truth come alive to us, all fresh and new, brand new year, a fresh year to get a fresh start in his word, abiding in his word, believing and living by his word. Maybe you um, would start today even as a new, new year, new week. You would start today spending some time in the Bible so that, remember, whenever you read it, God is speaking it again to you. What a miracle. 
What a gift. So maybe you'll determine that today even, this new year, you're going to hear from God every day through his word. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your truth. We thank you for the Bible. Wow. I mean, you've given us so many. I mean, you gave us your only begotten son so that we can have eternal life. And you gave us your word. And it's, it's, it's actually in printed form. We can carry it with us. We can read it anytime we want. We can memorize it. We can, Lord, what gifts you've given us. And we don't deserve any of it. So, Lord, let us in humility recognize how good and gracious you are to us. And let us embrace your word. And may it be planted deep within us. And may it shape and fashion us into the likeness of your son. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, a reminder, uh, there is no service tonight. Um, today was a record day of people falling asleep in church, okay? Um, uh, we watched some football last night. We watched the ball drop. We watched, you know, I know we were all up late last night. So uh, the, the day today is... Um, we're going to call it Sabbath. I know it's not the Sabbath day. We're going to call it Sabbath. So rest, okay? And so no church tonight. And we'll catch up again next Sunday for our full schedule. All right? God bless you. Have a great new year. You are dismissed.